Welcome to the Lover's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. As usual, you're with Mike and Ian. And we are reading through Patrick O'Brien's Aubrey Matron canon. We're up to the Yellow Admiral. Finished chapter two last week. Ian, please, would you be so kind as to let us know what we heard about and maybe give us an idea where we're going this week? With great pleasure, Mike. Here we go. Chapter three. We're looking back at last time. In the previous chapter, Jack and Stephen told each other they had no money. For very different reasons, their financial affairs are horribly involved. Jack is opposed to the enclosure of part of the local common estate, Simmons Lee, because it would take away the rights and the way of life for the commoners, making them completely dependent on large farmers like Griffiths. Bondon and Griffiths' gamekeeper had gotten into a scuffle and agreed to a prize fight, a boxing match in a place called the Dripping Pan. That's where we were, Mike. This week in Chapter 3, there's going to be that big prize fight. The women, just like always, are going to step up. We're going to have a bad omen, uh, maybe a little nobbling, a brief history of lechery, and some masterfully scary driving. Mike, I can't wait. Let's get into it. Oh, it sounds great. Well, seat opens on breakfast at Wolcom. You know, George and Bridget are delivering the mail since Killick and Bondon seem to have gotten a gig stuck in the neighbor's slough. So Henage Dundas has a note from his brother, the first lord. He wishes his brother would give him a better ship, and he notes that they're all going to be leaving soon, pointing out that Jack and Stephen might be leaving very soon. Jack says, well, as long as the Admiral doesn't summon him until after Friday's committee meeting in Parliament about this enclosure, he'll be fine. Hmm. <laughs> well, that's that's the first of many bits of Jeopardy that we're going to get introduced to in this chapter, as long as, as long as. Let's see how that's going to work out. So... Jack's not the only person whose future has a bit of uncertainty about it. Bondon, of course, is the person who is going to be in this prize fight. And it's Stephen who's going to visit Bondon and help us out with a bit of exposition here. Bondon is, as he calls it, pickling his fists in some kind of vinegar mix. Vinegar, strong tea, spirits of wine, something called tar bark, which, which might actually be tan bark, which is the, the bark of a tree like um, oak or hemlock, something that might ordinarily be used to tan leather because the tannins bind with proteins to make the hide tough and durable. So maybe that's what he's trying to do with his knuckles. And also, Mike, something called dragon's blood. And we think, if I'm right, that that's the uh, resin from some kind of a tree, usually a red resin that seeps out of the bark when it's cut and has some kind of pro-collagen effect, some kind of uh, soft tissue healing effect on the skin, forming a protective layer. So, uh, early version of uh, prophylactic skin treatment here for Barrett Bondon. He's getting ready for Wednesday's boxing match. And, Mike, I, I like this section that's coming up here. We always admire, I think, the way that O'Brien chooses to do exposition and educate us in the conversation that happens between the characters. Stephen, therefore, does us all the great service when he asks Bondon to explain prize fighting to him. And th th this that's coming up is a fascinating and kind of chilling introduction to what Bondon's about to face. But I think it makes us all nod along as well as we hear some of the references. We're hearing a little bit about the history of how modern day boxing got to be the way that it is. Bondon explains, he talks about how fights are organized and what they have to have, the conditions and, and setting up for the fight. He tells Stephen he prefers a ring made of ropes and post rather than just having the crowd form a circle around since the ring won't kick you if you're flung under it. So, you know, we're already getting a little hmm. bit, as you said, Ian, a picture of the jeopardy here that they're you know, going to be opposing crowds. And if you get thrown into the crowd, yeah, you just might <laughs> take some blows here. Stephen asks him if it's brutal. And, you know, Bondon says, well, there's no gouging or kicking or biting or hitting below the belt allowed. And you can't strike a man when he's down. He says, but that leaves a lot of leeways for fighters to do things like pin your head under one arm and pound away with the other until you can't see or stand. They'll also grapple, tip you, fall on you as hard as they can, accidentally done a purpose, or catch you by the hair and batter you. That's why he says most bruisers nowadays are cropped short. 
And Stephen says, well, you know, have you thought about crop and short? And Bond and say, no, 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 he's not going to cut off his 10-year-old, longest, luckiest, best pigtail on the barky. He's getting no Samson, as he puts it, no Cove in the Bible treatment for him. <laughs> the, the Samson and Delilah, you know, cut off your hair, you lose your strength here. Well, he says he's going to tie it up in a bandage and then have Killick tighten it between rounds. Uh, Stephen is like, w- w- you know, what do you mean rounds? And Bond then explains that a round is any time a man goes down, the fight pauses and then, you know, they come back and the fight ends when one of them can't come up to the scratch. That is that line that the, you know, the referee has drawn in the dirt there between the two of them after the pause, the, the slight intermission between rounds. So, and there we go. What does it mean to come up to the scratch? <laughs> Thank you, Patrick O'Brien. It's great, isn't it? A bit of boxing origin and a bit of uh, linguistic origin here. Um, Bondon carries on and explains that there's no limit to the total amount of time in the bout, and there's no limit to the number of rounds. He says it took him 68 rounds and one hour, 26 minutes to win the Navy Championship of the Mediterranean. There are some great London fights between famous prize fighters that had lasted longer. And as you would expect from Patrick O'Brien, he lists off these names of these prize fighters, and they're all authentic. They're all real fighters who were in the business at that time. There's uh, John Gully, there's the game Chicken, Henry Pierce, who Maturin met in a coach on the far side of the world. There's Jem Belcher, Dutch Sam, Sam Elias, who actually fought Tom Belcher, Jem's younger brother, who was another great boxer. So all these characters are absolutely taken from the real history of boxing in the uh, in the Georgian era. And Mike, we, we, we've had quite a bit of toxic masculinity exposed already here. Time for a little break. I think, as Stephen is interrupted by Bridget. Bridget says, "Uh uh-oh, toxic masculinity rears its ugly head again. George is bleeding like a holy martyr, she says, after she pushed him. (gasps) Not masculinity. It's the girls who are at it. She, Bridget, pushed George to show him what prize fighters did. Diana catches hold of them and says, don't worry, she says, Bridget had only tapped his claret, which is this very kind of old school cockney phrase, meaning drew some blood. She says he'll be fine. She's soaking his shirt, always pointing out that, of course, cold water is the only thing for blood. And Diana invites young Bridget to go and join George in the kitchen for syllabub, which sounds like a very nice treat, Mike, except the syllabub is whipped cream dessert, normally flavoured with masala or sweet white wine or sherry, which sounds sounds like a lot for a kid, especially one of what, right. kindergarten age. <laughs> Well, while the kids are imbibing their uh, their marsala wine-flavoured dessert, Diana tells Stephen that Jack's waiting impatiently for him to go and see the mirror, to see the pond, as they had planned. Yeah, and on the way to the mirror, Jack and Stephen run into Griffiths again. Mm. And Griffiths, this time, you know, is very chatty. He asks Jack if he's heard from the squadron. Jack says he hasn't. Griffiths says he's surprised, given this strong, steady wind in the southwest. And then he asks Jack if he's going to the fight between his head keeper and Jack's coxswain. Jack says, well, it depends. Griffin says, well, unfortunately, he can't because he has an important committee meeting to attend to. But he is willing to bet Jack anything he wants to wager, any amount, at seven to five odds against Jack's man. Jack says that he does not choose to bet. And Griffin's starting to write off says, well, you know, you know best, but. Fair heart never won fair lady, they say. So really a little bit of an odd bit of behavior from Griffiths here and another sting at Jack here. And this committee meeting rears its head again. Yeah, more jeopardy for Jack. Now, on the Wednesday then, Jack and Stephen go back to this mere, to this little pond, and they're talking to each other while they're preparing a hide. And Jack goes back to this phrase that Griffiths used about having a faint heart. He says, well, maybe I do have a faint heart. I'm worried if something happens on my ride to London, I might miss the committee meeting. And he says he's trying to stay calm. He hasn't even looked into the dripping pan where they're setting up for this fight. He says, yet, I I don't know how it is. He paused for quite a while. And then in the tone of one quoting an aphorism, he went on, the heart has its reasons that the that the kidneys suggested Stephen <laughs> that the kidneys know not Jack frowned no oh, hell and death that's not it but anyhow the heart has its reasons you understand 
I love Stephen's reply here. It is a singularly complex organ, I am told. And I am uneasy about a whole variety of things going on, Jack. <laughs> and he asks Stephen, don't you think there was something odd about the way Griffiths had talked to them? I'm like, I, I like this before we get into Griffiths a little more. Um, Jack, who we already know can just about manage to quote accurately the Bible and some bits of Shakespeare, is reaching quite hard here. He's reaching for uh, Blaise Pascal, 17th century philosopher and mathematician who wrote, the heart has its reasons which reason knows nothing of. We know the truth not only by the reason, but by the heart. So that's Pascal there mm. acknowledging the way subjectivity and emotion drive the actions that we take as humans, even when we are enlightened humans. So well done, Jack. Let's get back into this conversation then about what was going on with Griffiths' comment. Yeah. So, you know, Steve thinks about this and he says, yeah, you know, Griffiths was obviously more false than he had been before. He kind of wondered at his insistence about this win. What, with this win you haven't heard from the squadron yet? And he's suspicious that, you know, obviously Griffiths had ridden out to ask Jack for news. So, I, you know, he says that's kind of not typical for the behavior between the two of you who barely speak to one another. Stephen asks if the enclosure affects their admiral, Griffith's uncle, and if a great deal of money depends on the scheme. So you can see Stephen's brain yeah. starting to, you know, starting to work through this thing. Like, what, what's going on here? Jack says, well, the, uh, you know, the admiral has always been against Jack because he's a Tory and a naval member of parliament and because of his father, and he kind of sidestepping, you know, the admiral's, you know, we know the admiral was for this scheme, but he's kind of sidestepping it, but then says, and yes, the promoters do stand to make a great deal of money if this enclosure goes through. And so Stephen mm -hmm. says, well, you know, is this enough money to push men to extreme measures? And I think he's, you know, Stephen's wheels are turning on that, you know, yeah. there's this odd behavior on Griffith's part here. And Jack says, well, well, yeah, they do. And there's more than just money at stake here. Jack says it's also about being seen as a man of very high station with lots of property for farming and their kind of hunting and shooting and a crowd of respectful villagers who do what they're told and work for what's given to them. And Jack goes on and the, you know, the text says, a man that is in that position is as much of an autocrat as the captain of a man of war without the loneliness, the responsibility, the violence of the enemy, and the dangers of the sea. And he adds, they believe or have been persuaded to believe that what they're doing is all for the country's good. So, you know, kind of, you know, we're dancing around here that, you know, would these guys do something, you know, uh, get a little underhanded to get this enclosure through? Sounds like they've got a lot of motivation to do yeah. exactly that. And, and being willing to say that it's in the name of the good of the country. That sounds like the kind of thing that would ring Stephen Maturin's alarm bells loud and clear. Stephen digging, as I say, a little bit harder for what might be the true intentions of the Admiral, and maybe thinking on behalf of his friend about the uh, perspective of people who are in authority over Jack. Asks then, if the Admiral is, in Stephen's words, a man whose love of this country, of high station, and incidentally of a considerable addition to his fortune, might induce him to bend the ordinary course of morality so that good might result. Yeah, I mean, it, it, in other words, is the Admiral's reaction going to be completely predictable and completely driven by his interest in kind of pursuing things like enclosure? And Jack says, well, I, I, I don't really know. The Admiral has the reputation of being a good seaman, but his courage has never been tested. It's never been in doubt. But then again, he hadn't seen much action as a fighting sailor. He hadn't seen much in the way of prize money either before his own third of an enterprising frigate captain's prize money had brought him into the situation of being well-to-do. Jack would not have said that he's the, the kind of duplicitous man that Stephen's thinking of here. But as he gets older, says Jack, he trusts his judgment less, having been wrong so often. Oh, amen, Jack. Well done. Yeah. Stephen replies with, with even more grudging self-knowledge. Hmm, even I have made errors. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> but... <laughs> Before we get too deep into the introspection here between Jack and Stephen, uh, we and they are distracted by the sound of men beating in the posts that are going to make the boxing ring in the dripping pan. 
And I'm very tickled by the idea of the dripping pan. We had it mentioned in the previous chapter. I, I guess this is a reference to the shape of the hollow in the ground because a dripping pan is a piece of tin that you put underneath a roasting joint or a roasting spit to, to catch the fat, the dripping, as we would say. There's a sports ground to this day in East Sussex that is still known as the dripping pan. It's the home ground of minor league Lewis FC. If any any Lewis fans are in the uh, in the listenership, please give us a shout out on social media. Interestingly, in a recent book listing the top 100 British football grounds, the dripping pan, home of Lewis FC, was number one out of 100. And wow. I'm guessing that because it's a fairly small place and Lewis FC are not... Uh, a team about to set the world on fire. This is more about heritage and place and charm and bucolic associations than it is about scale or grandeur or revenue. Despite that, I'm proud to say that Newcastle United's St. James's Park um, was only in fourth place uh, behind the dripping pan. So well, well done, St. James's <laughs> Park. <laughs> nice. Well, after a very early dinner that afternoon, the gentleman excused himself to go see the fight. You know, Jack's telling the ladies that Stephen and Hedge say it would be disrespectful to the noble art not to see the first exchange. And, and anyhow, the doctor should be there to revive either of the dead. Because <laughs> <You know, laughs> that's what that, the doctor does, right? He revives dead people. <laughs> that's right. As long as the tide hasn't turned, Stephen's going to yeah. bring them back here. So, you know, Diana says that the, you know, the way the men had bolted down their food, that, you know, they were lucky to have been allowed to finish dinner at all. And, and Sophie's just delighted to have the opportunity to change. She'd spilled a little red wine on her gown. And they all talk about how the men just love to see fights and, you know, how distracted they are by them, how far they'll drive to see them, how completely taken up they are with them. And the cook comes in saying that the pump doesn't work and there's not a man left on the estate to fix it. She says even old Harding has crept off to see this horrible murdering match. And Sophie says, come now, you know, that, that match, it can't be that bad. The cook gives us just a little bit more jeopardy for Bondin. She says that, you know, Griffith's gamekeeper, you know, she calls Black Evans, beat a friend's husband so badly over a couple of poultry rabbits that he's never been the same. That this guy Evans was supposed to fight Tom Cribb, the, you know, the UK national champion, but was barred for fighting foul and gouging a man's eye out. Um, it took Sophie a while, but Sophie finally stops her telling all these bloody tales about the history of this fighter and convinces her to run off and use the dairy pump in, in the meantime. And as she's going, she says, okay, but I hope, in her words, Mr. Bondin ain't brought home senseless on a bloody hurdle like poor Hal. And, you know, I'm starting to get a little bit of like, wait a minute, what's, yeah, this is, you know, Bondin, he's our, he's our fighting champion here. What's going on? Yeah, and anytime somebody has invoked jeopardy from times past in chapter three of a Patrick O'Brien novel, um, it's come to pass. So I'm I'm worried for uh, for Bondon's uh, health and safety here. Um, I'm not the only one. Um, it turns out Sophie too is worried about her man, but she's worried not about uh, physical damage. She's worried about how far Jack is going to have to drive the next day to get to London after a long night. And Diana assures Sophie that he'll make good time on the turnpike road. He'll be sleeping, she says, in a post chaise. Um, it might not be a feather bed, as Diana says. She doesn't like feather beds anyway, saying, I love to have something really firm under my bottom. <laughs> I love the way Sophie blushes and uh, looks across to see Clarissa's complete deadpan non-reaction to this slightly licentious uh, form of speech. Uh, and Diana concludes, a man who can sleep aboard a small man of war beating into a gale can certainly sleep on a chase. And Mike, there's two things that are being planted here that I really like. A little smile on my face as I read these. Things that are being planted that will pay off in the future. One is Diana's put herself in the role of being the licentious free-speaking one, speaking very frankly about her female anatomy to make Sophie blush. And we, right. we're going to come back, I think, to this conversation about femininity and the body between Sophie and Diana. I'll say no more for now. And the second one, a little bit more distant, is just the idea that Diana knows this turnpike road very well, sees it as offering a really fast run for a chase, for a chase and four at any rate, um, as long as the driver is competent. 
stick a pin, I think, Mike, in both of those ideas. A chase, uh, you know, as, as they're speaking about a chase, uh, another one rolls right up into the driveway. And Diana recognizes the driver, Patty Callahan, a master's mate for the Ringle. Sophie runs to change her dress. She's, you know, she's not fit to receive company. But Diana tells her, don't bother. I'm going to deal with him in the courtyard. Callahan says that Captain Jenkins insisted that he take the chase to bring orders to Captain Aubrey to return immediately so that the Ringle does not miss her tide. And Diana tells him that Captain Aubrey is away in London on business, but that she'll see that he gets the orders just as soon as he returns and insists that Callahan ride back immediately so that the tender doesn't miss her tide and can rejoin the ship. She says in that wonderful phrase, there is not a moment to lose. So (laughs) here we have the first of several great gay for Diana moments in this chapter and in this book, as you say, Ian. I like the fact that there's some new, uh, new relationships being formed between the adults in the little group here. And we get a little bit more of this as Sophie expresses how she's taken aback that Diana could speak about deceiving Jack, in effect, concealing the arrival of these orders when he's so close, he's just over in the dripping pan. Diana gets into a bit more education of Sophie, pulls her into the drawing room, closes the door and says, listen, it would have broken Jack's heart to miss the committee and lose the commons. Sophie says, well, okay, but Jack would never forgive us for lying. And Diana gives this very nice, no, dear, this kind of verbal pat on the head and says, we need to get a message to Jack immediately to tell him not to come home, to go straight to Wharton and take the chase to London from there. Because if it all plays out that way, then we can maintain the polite fiction that Jack had not yet received these orders. Sophie says, well, there's that, that's a great idea, but there's no one to send. The men are all gone. Um, I can't send a maid into the rough crowd around that pub that's going to be going to have been drinking all day. And bless her, Clarissa steps up. She says she'll go. Sophie, who is feeling a bit ashamed of herself now, Sophie quite prides herself on her moral courage, I think, and is probably feeling a bit overcome by uh, by Clarissa's greater physical courage. Says, okay, but please at least take Grim, the stable mastiff. And this great big dog, who Diana has seen discourage a stranger before, is clearly you know, big enough and mean enough to put people off. Um, Sophie says she'll put on Grimm's choke collar while Clarissa gets ready. And Mike, I'm noticing here that Grimm is a mastiff, a stable mastiff. And I'm remembering that Ponto, back in Treason's Harbour, was another kind of mastiff. I think an Illyrian mastiff. But playing a similar role, I think, in guarding a lone female in rough male society. I do love that. So Diana knows that Clarissa's presence is not going to be noticed or remarked upon as much as, you know, hers or Sophie's would be. And she honors Clarissa for volunteering. Hmm. And when Clarissa comes back downstairs, she's gotten ready. Sophie asks if she isn't afraid of all these rough men. And I, and I love what Clarissa says here. No. As far as I've seen, apart from mere brute strength, they're no more formidable than we are. Less so, indeed, since most have that dog-does-not-bite bitch rule deeply ingrained, while Hmm. nothing of that kind applies to us. So we have, you know, here here with Diana, a very formidable woman. Clarissa, another very formidable woman. And Sophie, formidable in her own right. And perhaps, as you suggest, getting even more so as we progress through this novel. Yeah, she's learning a little bit of how, isn't she? Huh. Well, Mike, we've been talking about the boxing match now for quite a bit of the chapter. And it's interesting, the fight and the action around it genuinely does play a big part in what we read about and are presented with in the chapter. So it's kind of nice that we get straight into it at this point. It's Stephen who's watching the beginning of the boxing match, and he notices that Bondon is slightly taller than Evans, the other guy. But this Evans is broader and heavier. They're both, even so, big, powerful men. Neither of them has had the time to train. So it's going to be down to which one of them can use skill or their own kind of innate fitness and strength. The crowd includes most of the men and boys from seven different villages and the surrounding farms. As the fight gets underway, there are some heavy blows to the head and to the body that both men ward off. And then they close, trying to test out each other's strength. And from Stephen's point of view, it looks more like wrestling. And he notes that the uh, this ill-looking hairy fellow had seized Bondon's arm. And Jack says, 
He's trying for a cross buttock. We'll come back to cross buttock in a second. Um, it seems to be a potentially deadly throw, but Bondon twists and throws Evans flat on his face. Bondon's supporters holler for him to drop on him, fall heavy, kick him in the balls. But Bondon only nods, smiles, and walks back to his corner. So, Mike, Bondon belongs to the old school here. He's playing by the rules. He's a fair fighter. He's going with protocol here. Seems like the other fella may not be. This cross buttock thing, is it a terribly outlandish maneuver? What might it be? No, no. This cross buttock is it's it's a classic throw. It's classic in wrestling, it's classic in martial arts, and and in fact, it did make its way into classic English pugilism, where the boxer kind of turns their side to the opponent places their leg across both of the opponent's leg and, and kind of gets them over the back, grabs their arm so that they can't clasp around them and pulls the, the opponent forward over their hip. So it's it's kind of a conventional throw, if you will. And yeah, we've got a couple of social media tags we could send out there either uh, yeah. you know, to, to show yeah. some classic film of, of actually one of these or you know pictures from a film or you know a, a modern day discussion about where this came from and how this gets set up. Returning to the scratch for the next round, Bondin strikes very quickly and, and he, he lands several blows over Evans' guard. And Evans is staggering. It, you know, Bondin draws a surprising flow of blood, but Stephen noticed that Evans you know really seems to bear the blows with apparent indifference, and then closes on Bondin, and and you know they start struggling. Finally. Bondin breaks free, jumps back, and then springs forward with a left at full strength, which the text says would have ended the match had it gone home. But Evan surprises everybody for this big kind of brooding guy by shifting quickly six inches to the left. And Bondin slips on the grass and falls down to the hoots and derision of all of Evan's supporters. Oh, so it's working out very evenly so far. And as the rounds go on, we're looking at this through Stephen's eyes, of course. Um, Stephen notices that actually this fight is about much more than brute strength. Both of the men have been hit and hurt. Bondon moves more quickly and with more science, but Evans's blows, especially his body blows, are much harder. He watches them hammer each other in the middle of the ring with extraordinary speed and force, but realizes that almost all the blows he can follow are diverted by the other's guard, much like a fencing match. And as, as Stephen's watching this, this is described as being with almost instant anticipation of attack, recoil, parry, and lightning counterstrokes. He watches them and listens to the roar of the surrounding crowd and can hardly hear his own shouting. He's shouting for his friend Bonded. He thinks it must be a bit like being in an arena in a small provincial Roman town. And Mike, this is a funny little flight of fancy by Stephen here. It's funny as well that it takes us in the 21st century to the world of Russell Crowe and Gladiator. I think that Gladiator came out four years after this book was published, uh, three years before the Master and Commander movie. So maybe that's a bit of a stretch, but I, I like the association here. Yeah. Well, there are two long rounds, you know, each 10 minutes long, both ending when Bondin knocks Evans down. And then in the next round, Evans trips Bondin and deliberately falls on him and knees him in the ball. So now I think Evans realizing that he's, you know, he's getting, as you say, the short end of all of these, he's turned his tactics here. Well, the umpires and the referee vote two to one to let the match continue, despite all the howls of foul coming from the crowd. And Stephen can see now that both men have been severely beaten. Bondin shows it a little bit less, but Stephen's pretty sure that at least two or three of his ribs have been sprung. And he's astounded that both men have lasted this long. You know, this, this lack of training is showing itself. They're both completely exhausted. So we're pretty deep into this fight now, but I'm still thinking back to Bondin's description earlier on of, you know, dozens of rounds for a fight to go the distance. They're both suffering from the damage, though. The blood from Bondon's forehead blinds him. And with that advantage, Evans pushes him into a neutral corner, hides Bondon's body from the umpires with Evans' own bulk, and then tries to kick Bondon in the balls again. But Bondon jumps back against the rope and hits Evans twice. We get this really grim description of how Bondon feels Evans' teeth letting go. There's a shriek of pain, and Evans himself now heaves Bondon against the rope thrusts his head under the top rope, that 
parts the lashing on his hair as he fights back into the ring, trying to end the fight. With his last ounce of strength, Evans grabs Bondon's pigtail in both hands and hurls him into the corner post, falling himself as he does so. When time is called, Evans's men can just about prop him, as the book says, staggering half-conscious, half-blind to the mark. But Bondon's out cold. He's unconscious. Now, Stephen examines Bondon and says, Do not fear, Jack. There is a concussion, sure, but there is no fracture. The coma may last some hours or even days, but then, with the blessing, you will have your coxswain again. Oh, Mike, so we're all, I think, breathing a sigh of relief, at least for now. As Stephen tells Killick to go find a hurdle, as we were told that the, the loser might come home on a hurdle. Go find a hurdle to carry Bondon home and put him in the dark. And meanwhile, as the fight breaks up, there's more fighting breaking out between the Wilcombe men crying foul and the keeper's anxious minority of supporters. Yeah, they're, they're walking along, you know, slowly bonded on this hurdle. And Stephen asks if that was fair at all. And, and Dundas recalls that Gentleman Jackson held Mendoza by the hair when he beat him in 97. So he says, you know, maybe it's just fair. But then Dundas breaks off asking, isn't that Mrs. Oaks coming along the path with the stable dog? <laughs> so once again, Ian, as you said earlier, we've got these references to actual fighters. Mendoza, Daniel Mendoza, first British Jew to gain fame and acceptance as a professional fighter, became champion of England in 17. 17- 95, not 97, as O'Brien said, but he lost that title to Gentleman Jackson, who, as O'Brien did say, battered him senseless while he held his much prized pigtail in his hand. So a great, uh, you know, a great reference to to history uh, echoed in this fight here. Uh, Mendoza did have the good sense to go on and become the landlord of the Admiral Nelson Inn in East London. Now, huh. Gentleman Jackson that we just mentioned, John Jackson, ran London's foremost boxing gym. Uh, Jack actually visits that gym in the far side of the world. So we, we've had this before. <laughs> and he has a very famous clientele, such as Lord Byron there. He only actually fought three professional fights, including the one against Mendoza, and never defended his title after that. So in, in 1803, they actually named Jim Belcher to be the champion to replace place him. Jackson, along with Tom Cribb and some of these others that we've mentioned here, served as bodyguards at the 1820 coronation of one of Jackson's patrons, the former regent who now becomes George IV here. And Uh he, like Mendoza, also goes on to become a tavern keeper. And both of them sadly appear to have died in reduced circumstances. Ha! Huh. Wow. F- fascinating that we get a reference to a coronation just at this time, as we've recently crowned our our, our king, Charles III, rather than George III. Ha! Huh. Fascinating. Right. Well, makes me um, want to go back and look at the pugilist in the uh, audience. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Stephen sees Clarissa looking hesitant, and his intelligence agent brain springs into action. He hurries towards her. She tells him what's afoot with just no more than 10 words, and he asks her if it's okay if I just deal with it. She says, okay, and great, very good job for Stephen, realizing that Clarissa has this well in hand and doesn't want to just take over. He asks for her agreement first. Stephen calls back to Jack, and this callback is, of course, in public for everybody else's consumption, and it bamboozles Jack at first. Uh, There's been a misunderstanding, he says, and the chase that you're going to be sharing with Mr. Judd had been ordered for Wooten and is waiting there for him this very minute. And I love the, the description here of Jack's response. Jack was not always very quick in taking the point of Stephen's longer, more elaborate, and even wholly mythical anecdotes, but he knew his friend intimately well. He could interpret a certain fixity of look better than most men. He had a vague recollection of Mr. Judd as one of the deeper old files of Whitehall, and without hesitation he replied, "Ah, Hell and death, I must go at once. And to Clarissa, thank you so much for coming. Please give my dear love to Sophie and tell her I am very sorry if the blunder was my fault, as I dare say it was. And Mike, with, with a little great flow of husbandly judgment there from Jack and teamwork all around, I think that's a great moment to say, let's all catch our breath. 
let's let's make sure our uh, our head injuries aren't too uh, life threatening. Go and grab a little glass of something, and we'll come back after this short break. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Welcome back. We hope you had uh, enough time over the break to calm down and let your anxiety over the boxing match here subside a little bit. And let's just think about this fight scene because Mike even though it's a big part of the chapter and it's exciting that we get we get some first person action this is a little bit out of the ordinary for Patrick O'Brien isn't it 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 really is it's it's funny you know we're not really exactly sure whose fight this is is it Bondin's fight because you know we don't get much from his point of view we don't hear about his character you know thinking about it much ahead of time uh, don't know what was going on in his mind during it. The way it's told, I, you know, I'm not sure that it is Bondin's fight. I mean, Bond is clearly in it. But so, you know, you kind of wonder, as much as I love this and got completely caught up in it, what's it doing here in the story? Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? Um, maybe it, if, if we stop and think about it for a minute, maybe we're meant to see a connection. So I don't know. Maybe there's a connection to what's going to happen now and in the future. Maybe we're meant to see a connection between this and what might be about to happen in the committee. Maybe this is a counterweight or a metaphor for what might be, what might befall Jack and the villagers and the commoners when the committee sits. Maybe we're meant to see the connection between the world of Patrick O'Brien and masculinity and violence. You know, but Bondon doesn't ever complain or express anxiety about this violent encounter he's about to have. And he just strides into it like he's expected to give and receive blows and he's expected to take injuries and to recover. And I think we, we've had this in a couple of places before. O'Brien thinks that there's a version of masculinity where being a man in the world means you you dish it out and you take it and you don't really remark upon the fact. Right, right, right. Well, and, you know, we, we kind of have Diana saying, you know, in this little interlude with the women right after dinner, you know, this is what men do, you know, no matter what's going on in the world, they drive 40 yeah. miles to go watch a fight here. So, you know, we kind of wonder, as always, is this, you know, as you kind of mentioned, this is an omen or a metaphor about someone or something else here, maybe about the treatment of the villagers or the commoners of Simmons Lee. You know, is this kind of a representation of how they're going to be treated by Griffiths and his men after the committee renders their decision? You know, is this what happens to commoners at the hands of these brutes here? Yeah. And maybe part of this is to remind us that the struggle over the enclosure, the struggle over the the, the common land isn't only an abstract, genteel legal squabble between Jack and Griffiths and their associates. It's gritty life and death for the people on on the land. And part of their response to it is this fight, which is tinged with violence. And that makes me wonder, Mike, what what other kinds of violence might be coming our way in this chapter or in the book? It's it's a great question. Like every week, we just have to press on to find out, right? Stephen says he'll walk with Jack for just a furlong before, you know, heading off to see to his patients. And he takes that time to tell Jack what's happened. And Jack blesses Diana and Mrs. Oaks for their fast thinking. And he says that that Sophie, despite her spirit and her bottom, probably you know would not have thought about it in time. So he's not at all worried about missing the blockade for a few more days at this stage of the war, but would not have missed the committee meeting for the world. Now, he says he hates going with what he calls this damned unlucky omen, though. You know, he says that the keeper would not have made it through another round. Actually, he thought if Bondin could have come up to the mark at that last time, he could have you know, essentially just pushed the keeper over with his finger if the keeper was there at all. So Stephen knows that there's no arguing a sailor out of superstition. So, you know, he can't talk to Jack about whether this is an omen or not for the committee meeting. And yeah. he pauses for a minute because Jack is wondering, you know, does Stephen fear for Bondin's life here? And Stephen says, no, 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 I don't. And then Jack asks if Stephen thinks that these guys were trying to nobble him. And Stephen says, you know, I'm, I'm not familiar with that word. 
And Jack explains that it means interfering with a racehorse so that the horse doesn't run well. He says, just like that guy Dawson, who was recently hung, did. And Stephen says, well, you know, it would not surprise him, you know, that Griffiths would do something like that. But he really doesn't know the Admiral, so he can't say whether, you know, he thinks the Admiral's call for him to return to his ship immediately is is nobbling or not. And Jack says, well, he hopes Stephen's going to meet the Admiral on Sunday after Jack returns home and the two of them post down to Torbay uh, to find a vessel to take them to the squadron. And Stephen says, well, until Friday, then God and St. Patrick go with you. <laughs> it's it's funny, this this Dawson reference. And I, I thought, you know, this is just a, a quick aside from yeah. O'Brien. But no, no, no actual historical reference. Right. Right. So Daniel Dawson was a, a, a real figure in the horse racing underworld of the time. He was actually executed at Cambridge for poisoning racehorses, two of which died in 1809 and 1811. This was big news. Uh, Dawson had close connections with well-known sporting gentlemen, some aristocrats. He was suspected of being involved in a large-scale race-fixing operation. And, Mike, this makes me think of old Mother Williams, who was caught up somehow in horse racing as well. I wonder if she might have had a brush with this guy, Daniel Dawson, the nobbler. (sighs) Well, I I like to imagine that that's the kind of thing Mrs. Williams would have got into. (laughs) Now, let's go back to Stephen's little invocation, God and St. Patrick go with you. He had sort of sent St. Patrick along with Jack, hoping for protection, of course. That's why Catholics invoke the saints. And O'Brien tells us how that worked out as he opens up the next paragraph. He says, there are few more versatile saints than Patrick. And he managed the parliamentary business and the return journey supremely well until the very last lap. And Mike, there you go, classic Patrick O'Brien, all of the action of the journey into London and the committee that Jack was so anxious about, taken care of in passing, secondhand, in reported speech. The trip to London happened. It was successful. St. Patrick can claim some of the credit here. So here we are, completely undercut, if that was what we were expecting. Um, We're back on the homeward journey into Woolcombe. One of the horses then throws a shoe in the village that's within sight or would have been within sight of Woolcombe had it not been for the hill between the one place and the other. And Jack is sitting drinking ale at the tavern waiting for the blacksmith to come and take care of this shoe. The landlord, we learn, has a sister who's married to a commoner on Simmons Lee and wants to know what had happened in London. He sees Jack's beaming face come up from the tankard and asks if everything on the trip was quite to his liking. And here goes Jack's description of what's happened. Mr. Andrews, he says, I could not have wished for better. The petition for enclosure was rejected both for an adequate majority and above all for the Lord of the Manor's direct and firmly stated opposition. So the common is safe and we can go on in the way we're used to. So yay for Jack. Uh, We're going to hear some more about this in a second, but straight away, Mr. Andrews is delighted. He says, well, the lads had gone after the gamekeeper's pheasants after that dirty boxing match. When they hear this, they'll probably go go one better and stir up the deer as well. So a bit bit of revenge taking is afoot in the valleys here. He sends his sister's son to tell her everything's going to be all right. He says she won't lose her house. And in his exact words, the captain did the buggers in the eye. I love that. <laughs> Did the buggers in the eye. Well, in time, the horse gets its shoe replaced and Jack reaches Woolcombe, but not before you know the young man has reached it. So the cheering villagers are lined up waiting for his arrival. You know, they're cheering Captain Jack on. When he gets to Woolcombe, his family and friends are all lined up outside the house to welcome him home. And Jack greets them all. He shakes Bondin's bandage hand and hopes that he sees him tolerably comfortable and is delighted to see him on his feet, he says, after that cruel foul play. Now, Killick translates Jack's words into a very loud voice, you know, as we've often heard the men talking to somebody who's you know, been recently comatose or ill. Bondin kind of mutters something back to Killick and Killick says, he says the other side, the other party copped it worse and is despaired of. So I responded <laughs> claiming a little bit of a moral victory that, yeah, I'm, I'm back on my feet, but that other guy not doing so well. Inside, Sophie shows Jack the orders to rejoin his ship, which she says, 
came after you left, blushing no. as she says it. <laughs> so they still can't, you know, can't quite bring herself to uh, Diana's confidence to walk right across the line like that. Jack says, yes, he'd heard about them and will drive to Torbay tomorrow if Stephen can make it or, or the next day if Stephen can't. And Diana says, well, no, no, I'll drive you all down in Chumley's machine with six horses if General Hart, Aubrey's neighbor, provides his extra pair as he's promised to do. Diana says she's always wanted to drive a coach and six on the English turnpike. And Sophie's alarmed, saying, wait, 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 you've never driven that before? And Diana says, oh, yeah, I have, but only in India and Ireland. And, you know, I think Ian, you and I both had the same reaction. General Hart, Hart, wait, like Admiral Hart, what, what, what's <laughs> going on? <laughs> you know, as far He's as back from tell, the grave. no relation to the other Hart, and you know, o- O'Brien is clearly toying with us. I think absolutely. Uh, good news, uh, readers. I'll, I'll apologize for the spoiler here. I've I've searched ahead. There's there's no more Hart action in this novel. We can rest easy. Right. Now, this is the chance then for for Jack to tell what had happened. And it's told in very much the same way that we were told about the court case back in Reverse of the Medal. Jack gives an account of how the trip went. He says that key moment right from the start is that neither Griffiths nor Griffiths' lawyer had known that the committee chair, Harry Turnbull, was Jack's cousin. Twice over, in fact, once directly and once by marriage. Griffiths was also not a member of a London club and didn't know about any of these connections. On the contrary, several members of Blacks were also on the committee. So Jack has got an advantage here, and Griffiths hadn't realized it. Jack wasn't completely free and clear, though, because uh, he had cause to be grateful. Uh, Harry had been in a horrid rage from losing money gambling and would therefore not lend Jack a shirt beforehand as he was asked. So how is it going to work out? As it turned out, badly for Griffiths. Griffiths' lawyer had mumbled, which in turn had enraged Harry Turnbull. Uh, Turnbull was further upset that the petition didn't contain the signatures of the parson, the patron, or the lord of the manor. Jack stood up and said that he was the patron of the living and the lord of the manor, and his signature was not there because he was very strongly opposed to the enclosure and the petition. And I I love this dismissing line here from Harry Turnbull. God's my life, sir. This is him to Griffiths. You have the effrontery to present this with just the barest majority by value when you know perfectly well that three quarters or four fifths is the usual figure. And to make things worse, far, far worse, you do so against the will of the Lord of the Manor, your natural superior. I have never heard of such a thing. I wonder at it, sir. I wonder at it. Yay. Another silent round of applause for us as we're reading and listening here. Uh, And we we get a silent round, not so silent round of applause from the people in the household around us here. The cook breaks through Killick and Nason listening at the door and tells them that she needs to know this very minute if the 26 pound and four ounce salmon, which arrived a quarter of an hour ago, is to be cooked for dinner tonight since it must go on at once. So... Happy days already, feasting to come here in the household. They all look admiringly at this beautiful, clean-run salmon, this great big fish, and the card here. For our captain, with love from all at the Aubrey Arms. So we we get a little moment of celebration here. Yeah, really nice. Well, you know, this being O'Brien, it can't all go swimmingly forward. O'Brien writes, that night which should have been equally triumphant, was not. Misunderstanding, mistiming, and mere weariness played their not uncommon part. And for once, Jack Aubrey got up in a bad temper of mind. So Jack's up really early, you know, before dawn. He's got to start this journey, that long journey today. He cuts himself shaving. And as he comes back into the room, you know, Sophie, who's kind of, you know, tucked under her dressing gown, changing, as ending some muffled remark, and all he hears is that Mrs. Oaks. And, and Jack, you know, he's learned a little bit. He checks his immediate response. And then after he ties his neck cloth, he turns to her and says, you know, you often say that Mrs. Oaks in a tone that makes me think you imagine something improper about our having been shipmates. Look, even if I had been Helio Gabless or Colonel Chartres, <laughs> there could be nothing possibly anything improper. 
She came aboard without my knowledge, under the protection of one of my midshipmen. I at once insisted upon their being married. I even gave a piece of that crimson silk I bought you in Java for her to be married in. I may have been something of a rake when I was young, but I give you my sacred word that I have never played the fool at sea, and I should never, never at any time look at the wife of one of my officers. So I beg we may hear no more of that Mrs. Oakes. Well, Sophie blushes furiously, makes no reply, and O'Brien tells us that the extreme awkwardness between them is somewhat resolved by the time that George and Bridget beat the breakfast gong, still there in their nightshirts. The whole house is is now up and moving towards breakfast. Well, you know, Mike, I I was... I remember cheering for Sophie Aubrey that she was expressing her own perspective and her own strength of opinion about what was going on in a marriage. But I've got to say, I'm also cheering for Jack, that he's managed to find a moment to say, do you know what? I didn't do the thing that you think I did, and I'm going to say it to you now, and I'm not going to blame you. I'm just going to say, please, let's put an end to this. And I think I'm so glad that he got this moment, and I'm so glad that this means that as a couple, they're going to move on. I'm I'm kind of amused as well that it's the kids banging the uh, the breakfast gong that have uh, that have broken the tension here. Um, let's take a little look at some of the names here. We have Heliogabalus and Colonel Chartres. Do we do we know anything about these people in real life? Well, we do. Uh, both both real life characters. Ian is always this Heliogabalus. The actual names like that were given to him after his reign. He was Marcus Aurelius Antonius the teenage Roman emperor from 2018 until his murder in a coup in in 222. So, you know, very early on. And that imperial name given to him after the fact uh, um, that Jack used is the Roman name for the god Baal, a god of Assyrian cult. You know, Old Testament fans will know him well. And this guy, Marcus Aurelius Antonius, was a hereditary high priest of this sect, which was famous for its orgiastic ceremonials. Ooh. History tells us that this youngster, who was kind of you know a fourteen-year-old pawn put on the emperor's seat by his grandmother's power grab, uh, as as a youngster disregarded you know Roman religious traditions, disregarded sexual taboos. He actually reminds us a little bit of Joffrey in Game of Thrones, right? Yeah. <laughs> your, 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 your parents or your grandparents, you know, kind of maneuvering here and, oh, I'm the king now or I'm the emperor now and I can kind of do whatever I want here. And this Colonel Chartres, you know, Francis Chartres, uh, again, sort of uh, early, early 18th century was a notorious Scottish gambler, usurer, and rake. He actually was called the Rape Master General of Great Britain. Now, he was actually in the British and Dutch armies, but never rose above captain. So this, you know, Rape Master General, this colonel titles, all kind of mythical. And he was dismissed from both of those armies for dishonesty. But, you know, both of these guys kind of Jack setting the bar as, you know, even if I was the greatest lecturers in history, you know, I would not have done this action, not with one of my officers wives here no they all leave before first light Killick and bonden are in a chase behind jack stephen diana hennage sitting beside diana up in front in in the coach there and jack is thinking that you know he really hates disagreeing with sophie and especially just before they part like that and he realizes that her comments about mrs oaks had irritated him because he was in fact really tempted by her and had to, in his own words, impose a most rigorous self-command to, you know, to, to not act on that. But he is sorry that he spoke so harshly to Sophie. Now, he is, I think, trying to get himself off of that. And he says to Stephen there in the coach that, you know, Harding thinks that the salmon that they received had actually been ordered by Griffiths, had come in by coach, and, you know, was kind of accidentally perhaps left at the arms rather than the, the goat and compass. Other people said that Griffiths had, in fact, been planning a big dinner after the committee, you know, with kind of his supporters here. And Jack is concerned, he says, that his people are coming at it too high. You know, all this yeah. stirring up the pheasants, stirring up the deer, stealing this salmon here. And Stephen confirms that, yeah, in fact, they took some of Griffiths' deer last night. Stephen says he heard shots. And Jack is 
upset, but he stays quiet because they've just entered the town right by there. And, and many of the overexcited youths are still you know, running about. They're kind of you know, celebrating in the streets here. And he's really <laughs> glad that General Hart had, in fact, not given them the two extra horses with all this commotion as they're trying to drive the coach through the street here. And even without the two horses, Dundas is, is tempted to take the reins from Diana because the horses start acting up. But then he sees this determined expression on Diana's face and hears the way her voice recalls the horses immediately back to their duty. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad, you know, Dundas is like, oh, oh, I can't let a woman drive through all this. But he sees that Diana is very much you know, in charge here and capable of driving through it. Yes, and, and let that be a lesson to all of us backseat drivers, um, a lesson that hasn't quite been learned completely yet in this chapter, I don't think. Now, right. going back to people going after Griffiths's deer, Jack is willing to see Griffiths' side of it. He says, this is all fun, but it's a grave matter. If you become before the court, and especially if you went in disguise, and especially if you're armed, he says that Griffiths is bitter and he's weak. He had quailed in the committee before Harry Turnbull, but he's also cruel. And he says, and there was that damned unlucky omen nodding towards the chase that's carrying Bondon. So like we suspected, Mike, the, the, the fight for Bondon was a bit of a signal of how we're meant to think about the, 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 the completeness of any of these victories. It seemed like Jack had a complete victory in the committee still left uneasy by the outcome of Bondon's fight. Now, Jack looks out at the last side of Wilcom and he sees more damage. He sees stacks of bales of grain or hay on fire. And he asks the groom, is that Hordworth's rickyard? That's to say you know, the area where they stack up hay. The groom says, it's on Captain Griffiths' land. He says, the new piece that he took in to round out home farm. So uh, we've got people going after Griffiths' deer. We've got people burning Griffiths' hay. Um, it's all kicking off here in the villages since Griffiths lost out in the committee. As they carry on along the journey here, they're coming into the deep descent to Maiden Oscott with the bridge over the stream. And O'Brien readers, stick a pin in Maiden Oscott and the bridge. This is an important moment for us. Jack hears Diana encouraging the horses in the way that she does. Up in front of them, there's a dog cart, a little horse and cart, with a young man and a girl. Diana puts it on Dundas to have these two locals uh, pull over, and Dundas gives them this nautical roar, saying, pull over, for God's sake. The young man speeds up instead. And we've all had that happen to us on a narrow road. Um, in any case, Diana overtakes them. Dundas continues to holler as they're overtaking. The girl finally convinces the young man to put one wheel of his dog cart into the grass as Diana flies by. I think we're meant to believe with scant inches to spare. Stephen says it was two feet. We had two feet in this gap here. And Jack says, we've got this bridge coming at Maiden Oscott. I'm dreading it. He wanders out loud. Does Diana know it? And I, I, I love this moment here. She's been driving all over, says Stephen, for some time. He asks where young Philip Aubrey is, and Jack says, well, he stayed behind to worship Mrs. Oakes, and goes on to tell Stephen about the steep hill. We're coming into the middle of the village at Maiden Oscott, then there's a sudden 90-degree turn hard on the left with a low stone wall. Jack's explaining here just how tricky this is. If you hit the corner, you're in the river with the coach on top of you. And maybe, he says, Stephen should mention it to Diana. All right, Stephen clearly knows his wife very well, but Mike, I'm not sure that Jack knows Diana as well as perhaps he should. No, no, I, I, I think you're right. Stephen it says, like, you know, no, I, I do not think I should mention it. I don't think you should mention it. She's a fine whip. And I think right. Jack hearing whip is thinking, oh, my God, she's going to go even faster. So Jack says, well, you know, I, I think I should mention it because – you know, really, I think he's scared. <laughs> he wants Diana yeah. to slow down, much like we've heard some of Diana's other passengers earlier in this book talk about. So Jack lowers the glass and calls, oh, cuz, cuz. Diana slows down just a little bit and says, what now? Jack says, well, you know, since she's a native, perhaps he should tell her about the, the dangerous, the, the very dangerous bridge ahead. But, but perhaps he says, you know it. 
Diana says, Jack Aubrey, if you do not like the way I drive this coach, take the bloody reins yourself and be damned to you. So Jack, mm-hmm. properly admonished, you know, sticks his head back in the, ch- in the coach here. Well, the horses speed up. And Jack says, well, perhaps I've vexed her. But, but I did speak, you know, meek and civil. And Stephen says, yeah, perhaps you have. The slope gets steeper and steeper. Dundas is hollowing, you know, hallooing to get cats and dogs and asses and children out of the way as the horses go even faster than Diana normally would have let them go. So Jack has Ooh. just pissed a little <laughs> gasoline on fire, so to speak, here, you know. But O'Brien tells us she has a reins just so. She's in close touch with the horse's mouths. She's staring at the leading left-hand corner of the bridge, a corner that O'Brien tells us is scored by the innumerable vehicles that have hit it over the last 400 years. Yeah, this is a, a scene of a lot of wrecks and accidents. Diane looks down at the hub of her wheel. She's kind of gauging, you know, how much space do I need here? She changes the pressure on the reins, clucks to the leader, swings onto the bridge, missing the stone, O'Brien says, by half an inch, and trots to the other side of the bridge. Whoa. <laughs> uh, a moment of actual outright hubris for Diana and, and a little bit of shame for Dundas and Stephen and Jack for all having thought and really failed to express any kind of opinion about the safety of, uh, of Diana's driving here. <sighs> so they stop at a famous coaching inn on the Exeter Turnpike. It's next to a delightful stream. And we have this really nice bucolic moment between the little collection of them here. Jack, which is up to hand Diana down from the coat, asks her pardon for sticking his nose in. She says, never mind, gives him a brilliant smile. And it's so generous of her. She says, well, it's okay. I have been frightened aboard your ships. Ah, oh. well done, Diana. <laughs> And uh, she's clearly in high spirits. She says, get in there, order me up a second breakfast, a large one. I need to retire for a moment. And uh, it turns out that Jack is on something a little bit like home turf in this obscure pub on the Exeter Turnpike. He's greeted by two old friends, one who has the nickname Old Lechery, which kind of worries us a little bit, given the uh, the references that Jack made to, to Colonel Chartres and others earlier on. These two old friends show him the glorious trout that they've caught and invite Jack and his party to breakfast with them. The two fishes ain't in it, nor the five loaves, says Jack. I think he's admiring the catch here. Of course, a reference to the the loaves and the fishes, uh, Matthew chapter 14. Um, They say there's going to be enough for supper too. And uh, noting that, or rather failing to note that Jack's female companion, Diana, has just stepped out of the scene for a moment. They get all boys club on Jack. They say, well, we've got Nellie Clapham and her young sister Sue with us here. And this whole thing grinds to a halt when Diana appears clearly not a lady of pleasure, but nonetheless coming to join them. Stephen makes the introductions all the way around and tells Diana they've been invited to breakfast on this noble trout. Diana says she's happy to eat with them and their friends, the good-natured young ladies she'd met on the stairs that sang so sweetly. The girls (laughs) join them. I I think they're, yeah, they're they're a little little wary at first, but then they realize Diana is not going to give herself airs or graces and everyone has a really cheerful breakfast. Nellie even goes to uh, retrieve her guitar She sings them a little song everybody in the inn enjoys, including, O'Brien writes, a beaming, barely recognizable killick at the window. Huh. (laughs) Well, one of the men begs Diana and her party to stay and have dinner with them, promising some other wonderful dishes and clearly hoping for more exciting company. Diana says, thank you. I would with all my heart, but I have promised to deliver these gentlemen to Torbay and deliver them I shall, in spite of a certain timidity on the part of some of the crew. End of chapter three. Ooh. <laughs> so, Mike, I, I, I love that we get a sign-off, we get a button on this whole episode uh, from Diana in such high spirits, 
in such a strong position. This this is a, a, a chapter where Diana is being restored to us. She having been so far distant from Stephen for the whole of the previous, what is it, two or three books. And I'm really, really happy with that. But in all these other respects as well, Mike, it's been a really interesting chapter, right? Well, it really has been, you know, and it's just fascinating the way we were set up for this chapter in the last chapter. I mean, the last chapter was a lot of exposition and education, teaching us all about enclosures, talks about democracy, bird metaphors and all that. And and I, it's funny because my first reaction to this chapter was, oh, all that's gone. It's just a lot of action and it rolled right along. And oh my gosh, look at this, this big fight scene here. And I kind of missed at first how much it set us up for what happened in this chapter and how much this chapter kind of reflects back on what we had from the last chapter, you know, and propels us forward. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Very good. And it's so much more than just the boxing match is the boxing match in context. And it's what it means to the people of the village. We were, we're still in this social thing of the, the different perspectives and the different impacts for people who are of Jack Aubrey and Mr. Griffiths class and the people who are of Bondon's class. And, uh, still not yet to see. We still haven't even looked at the orders yet, so there's plenty still to come here. We hope, I think, Mike, that Jack and Sophie are going to have happy sailing from now on. I was really worried about them all, all the way up, really, until the beginning of the book, all the way up until this point. I, as, as long as that last intervention from Jack's has left them without any remaining awkwardness, I think we could be okay. And uh, thanks to the children, of course, for using the dinner gong to help that all blow over. Right, right. Well, we've got some real jeopardy here, as as we so often do. And we've got things that, you know, seem to have ended happily, as you were saying, that we kind of wonder a little bit, you know, is the enclosure thing a done deal now? Or what about Jack worrying that these people are just taking it a little bit too far, you know, risking Griffiths and his gamekeeper's wrath? You know, we saw how that turned out with Bonded, uh, that that side does not play fair. That side does not take prisoners. So there right. may be a little bit coming there. And it worries me. Stephen kept saying, but what about the Admiral? But what about the Admiral? And Jack doesn't seem to have given that much mind. He's clearly blown off the Admiral's orders. So he's flying in the face of a man he's already said does not like him. Uh, we don't know exactly how committed the Admiral was to the enclosure scheme. But, you know, with all of Stephen's question... I can't help but think, you know, how's that going to go? Yeah. So not only then, how is the enclosure going to go, but how is the presumed mission of the Bellona at some point going to go? Um, they're on the blockade, which doesn't sound like very exciting duty for a man of Jack Aubrey's character, but this is Patrick O'Brien. We, aren't, we haven't even set foot back aboard the Bellona yet. There's no telling when we'll get there or what will happen when we do. And... Mike, maybe some of all the jeopardy and the anticipation and the bad omens didn't only apply to Bondon, didn't only apply perhaps to the ongoing dispute over property. Maybe there's some bad omens here for Jack and the crew and the Bologna as they finally get to see. You know, you really got to wonder about that, Ian. Like you say, you know, whenever some of these things come up early in the book, you know, we know O'Brien has a way of playing them out here. So I, I think we're, we're we're looking at all of that. And, and I've got to mention, like we did last chapter, there was a lot of great writing in this chapter, a lot of great family and child moments that we didn't have time to cover here. So if you right. love those like we do, by all means, don't miss out on them. But, or I should say, and... You know, I think we better press on to find out what happens next. What do you say, Ian, next week to just a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? Mike, I should like that of all things. He goes on. We're digging hard for what might be the motivations of the Admiral. Oh, sorry, Mike. I missed you there. No, I'm sorry. 
when you said it, you know, it was the kind of thing that would ring Stephen's alarm bells, I'm saying, yeah, the kind of thing that rings my alarm bells. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Sam, yeah. I love it when it goes all smoothly like this, and it just kind of flows. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I love it. Ah. All right, let, let's you carry on there. 